Last time I was here, um, I sat at Matt's table, and um, he invited me to, to come to um, Matsue to, um, you know, to speak at a conference there. And um, it was a bizarre experience, I'll tell you. Um, you know, the, the mayors would, would come out and, and, you know, greet all these, you know, American rock stars. And, of course, I'm, I'm no rock star. You know, I have my business, my tiny little business of four, and it was um, pretty unusual. How many of you have coded in, um, let's say, two of the languages on, on the, um, or how many of you have heard of seven languages in seven weeks first? So um, the languages are Ruby, I.O., um, Prolog, Scala, uh, Erlang, Clojure, and Haskell. How many of you have coded in at least two of those languages? Three, four, ah, five, six, okay, five is the max. So nobody's made it all the way through the book yet. Um, and it's really not fair because we have um, seven languages to get through in about 35 minutes. And it's really a 45-minute talk. And the last time I gave the talk, or really the only other time I gave the talk, I went about 15 minutes over. But we'll, we'll get about as far as we can. So this was the most interesting writing project that I've ever encountered just because of the, um, the breadth of the material. Um, the, the goal of the project was to was initially going to be to write the same difficult problem in seven different languages. And then after I got about, um, I don't know, a, a chapter or two into the book, I quickly decided that it was more important to show um, a, a, a problem that really worked in the language that I was trying to solve. So the problem became to take somebody to the point where they could solve a non-trivial problem in seven different languages. And my first, so the technical challenges just kept coming, and they, they didn't quit coming until I finished the last chapter, and then they came a little bit after that. It was just absolutely um, mind-boggling um, to, get, to get through learning that many languages and get to the point where I could actually teach something interesting in them. Um, the first writing challenge came when I turned from page 34 to 35, and um, that took me from Ruby to I.O. And I thought, something is missing here. And I looked at the transition. It looked OK. Um, at least the words made a transition. But it was hard to move the reader's head from one language to another one with a simple, simple page turn. And I brainstormed with my, with my editor for a little bit about this. And eventually, we came up with the idea of associating each programming language to a character in the movies. Um, and so um, along the way, I want to do that not just with these seven languages, but with other languages that, are, that were influences along the way. So we're going to go through the languages in the book in um, chronological order and then talk about the influences, um, the other languages that kind of impacted them um, or were going on at the same time. So we're going to start in 1972 in, in prologue. Um, so what movie is this? Rain Man, Rain Man right. Um, so I thought that this was a good analogy because prologue seemed so alien to me. When I was writing a prologue application, I would sometimes think, how did it know that? And sometimes I would think, how doesn't it know that? And um, so, so Rain Man was a, a great example. And so in 72, if you were writing something, a, a high performance application, you'd use this language. Shout them out as you know them. Assembly language, right? So, um, and just, just to, to give you the idea, this is C3PO. His, he's not, you know, he doesn't carry a weapon, he doesn't cut metal or anything. He just translates one, one line of whatever language is coming in to um, whatever goes on the other side, right? So, one level of like English looking code to one level of machine code. So, that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, and um, if, if you're writing a business application, you'd be using COBOL. COBOL, and I'm not sure quite which is older, Rocky or COBOL. You know, I think they're both going to outlive me. Um, or if you were using a scientific, writing a scientific application, yeah, you'd be writing Fortran. Um, you know, guys, the, the front of this quote is, if my calculations are correct, when this baby hits 88 miles an hour, you're going to see some serious shit. Um, back to prologue. 
this was a fascinating language. This was the first language that really changed, um, changed the way that I was thinking in the book. Um, IO did a little bit, but since that was a prototype language, that's close enough to an object-oriented uh, model that I could approach problems in the same way. And um, for Prolog, I had to change the way that I was thinking. This is a Hello World application, and the way to read it is that the thing on the, the left is true if there's a set of variables. Well, there's no variables here. They're all constants. But if there's a set of variables on the right-hand side to make that thing th true. And the, the non-trivial problem that I decided to solve in that language was solving a pseudo and I picked that language because that was really the first um, non-trivial problem that I decided to write in Ruby. And um, I was really proud. It took me about two weeks. Um, and, you know, I, I wound up with, I don't know, a couple hundred lines of code. And, and um, you know, I would built into it like eight or nine, you know, solution techniques to reduce the problem um, before I started guessing. Um, now, with Prolog, I didn't have to think about any techniques at all. I described the, the problem. This is what that looked like. So the first line says that an empty list is valid. And the second line is going to take a list of rows, columns, or squares. And it's going to say that is valid if in the first, for the first element, all of those are different and the rest of the list is valid. So it's a recursive definition. Then you basically define a board. And you know, being a, a new Prolog programmer, I kind of brute forced this thing. So I said, these are um, 81 um, you know, rows, rows and columns, or 81 elements. And then there's a board. And so I associate the board to, these, to a list of these things in the right order. And then I said, everything in the board has to be a digit from 1 to 9. So you can see what I'm doing here. I'm describing the problem. These things are rows, these things are columns, and these things are squares. And all the rows, the list of rows has to be valid, the list of columns has to be valid, and the list of squares has to be valid, and you are done. And this is what the API looks like in use. And that's pretty cool. I mean, we have, we have built a Sudoku solver in Prolog. And I can't count the number of times that I've had to do something um, that's constraint-based, you know, a logic problem in, in Java or a rules-based problem in Java where I could have reached for Prolog and had the solution in 20 minutes rather than, you know, taking three or four weeks or even a month to, to write some, some Java or some Ruby, Ruby code. So um, Prolog was the first language in the book that um, changed the way that, that I thought. So, um, and this is the, the way the solution comes out. That's basically all I have to say about Prolog. The next language that we're going to talk about chronologically is Erlang. Yeah, this is Agent Smith of the Matrix. Um, any of you written any Erlang? So what do you think of the syntax? Um, how many people really, really like it? How many, okay, how many don't? Um, so, so I don't like it at all. I think that, um, that Erlang is a language with, with um, a, lot of, a lot of power but no soul. And that's why I picked Agent Smith at the Matrix. <laughs> and I wanted to um, talk about some of the things that I was coding at the same time. And at the same time, here's the, the first language. What language is that? Basic. Basic, right? Sesame Street. I think that the Muppets are actually smarter than, than the perceived years, right? So there are all these inside jokes. Um, but then there's the close cousin of BASIC. What's that? Visual BASIC, right? Yeah, you guys get that. So every, you know, just like with, with vacation, starting the trip is easy, and everything's a little bit harder than it, it needs to be. Um, in college, I was writing this language. Pascal, right. Pascal now, Haskell later, right? But um, I think that, like Forrest Gump, this is a wise language. Um, it's not like super intelligent in terms of the features that, that are in it, but the omissions and, and the shape of the language really um, were, were very well done, I thought. Um, so it, it's a wise language. There's another one. Anybody know what that one is? That's small talk. 
And this is an interesting language because it was getting big at the same time that Joe Armstrong was designing Erlang. And he looked at that, I looked at that language and I saw something beautiful and I saw a way to, to organize things and, and think about the problem in a different way. Joe Armstrong looked at, at small talk and he saw something, he, said, he saw a mutable state. And it scared him to death. And, and so he never went down that path. He intentionally um, stayed away from that path. Instead, he was writing in this language, Fortran, in this language, Prolog. In fact, the original versions of the Erlang interpreter were written in Prolog. This was the primary influence. Um, back to Erlang, this is what a Hello World would look like. And the reason that this syntax is subtly different than Prolog is that they basically had to make a departure from Prolog to, um, to get the, um, to, to make sure that this, this could handle the, um, the phone switch um, requirements. And those were that this, thing had to, this system had to be live all the time. Now, when I think about scalability and reliability, the first things that come to my mind in language features are, are things that handcuff you. Things like strong static typing. And they're going to scare everybody in this room to death because we're so used to things on the Ruby side. But that's not the way that Erlang approached the problem at all. Erlang approached the problem by um, a very effective virtual machine that knew how to monitor what was, that, what was going on with other processes. So whenever a process dies, you are guaranteed to, um, to get notification from um, other processes or two other process that you're, processes that you're registered to in the same virtual machine. So here's a trivial application that's unreliable. It's Russian roulette. If you get a, if you get a three, it's going to basically um, kill the process, and anything else is going to, you know, print the word click and, and keep going. Um, so this is an unreliable process. And this is um, another process that might watch the first process. Um, it returns a, a new um, roulette, um, roulette process, and if it gets an exit message, it's going to pass the new message to itself starting another roulette process, right? So it's like Russian roulette without the consequences. You know, what's the point? But so um, that's all I've got to say about um, Erlang. And now next chronologically, um, and, and definitely not, uh, definitely the last language in the book in terms of the difficulty of, of actually grasping it is the Haskell language. And you guys get the, this um, comparison right off. Um, here's a language that you guys are never going to get. I have to give you a clue. This was um, a commercial language that was all about um, lazy, um, lazy processing. So the word, you know, the, the clue here is lazy. The language is called Miranda. So when Miranda was created, a whole lot of um, offshoots of functional um, programming started um, to get built to address some of the holes in the thinking of the time. And academia was saying, wait a minute, we know that these ideas are important, but there's too much of a proliferation of the languages to actually control. So they formed a committee to actually build a language. And to my knowledge, this is the only language that has been um, effective language that has been created and built in a committee. Um, I know you, could, you might say Java, but Java was really created in a, small, um, in a small lab, and the committees came later. This language was actually built, designed, and, um, and it's grown in a committee. Now, some of the other things that were happening at the same time, well, of course, there was small talk, though this was a comp very much a competing um, you know, thought, a thought group, or the object-oriented languages. Of course, Erlang was, was created. Now, Erlang lets you do things to, to make these beautiful name value databases like CouchDB that we talked about in the last se session. Um, it's not a pure functional language. It's pretty close, but there are places where you can kind of step outside of the functional paradigm to do things like Erlang.display to display a string or, um, or actually store um, an element in a hash table. And, of course, 
um, C was, was, um, was a, a pretty big influence in the universities at the time. Now, with Haskell, you really don't have I.O. without, um, without shifting into, the, um, into an idea that's called monads. And I really didn't want to get into that concept with, um, with a talk this short because it's, um, they're, they're pretty conceptually difficult. Um, what you really do is define functions that return values. And there's no notion of anything like a, um, a side effect or um, a change in state. It's, it's, it's a very pure functional language. It's not a strict functional language. And what that means is that um, you can declare a function that defines an infinite um, number of uh, basically a sequence. And the se sequence might be an inf infinite sequence. This is what I'm talking about. So the first, the first function there is an infinite sequence that represents um, part of a definition of a Fibonacci sequence. And that idea is that um, the next number of the sequence is um, the, the sum of the previous two numbers, right? So the colon on the right-hand side is list composition. So I'm adding whatever um, x was. You know that's wrong. Uh, Fibonacci xy is y plus, oh, no, it's, it's x plus the um, uh, lazy fib of, of the lazy Fibonacci sequence with y and x plus y, right? So, you, um, so that's an infinite sequence with, with no bound on the front end, or no bound on the back end, and we're going to anchor it where the first two numbers are one and one, but so I'm defining an infinite lazy sequence based on a lazy sequence with the second function. And the third function, I essentially um, take the first, if for the 500th Fibonacci digit, I take the first 500 and then I drop off the first 499 to have a list and I just take the head of that list, right? So these are two lazy sequences um, that are used to compute the value of a concrete sequence. Now, the reason that this is interesting is that when you're using lazy sequences, you're, um, you're not computing um, values until you absolutely need them. So they can be very efficient at times. But sometimes it makes programs and the ordering of things hard to reason about. Now, the other thing about Haskell um, is the typing system. Now, um, I have always thought, well, my, my youngest daughter, when she was two years old, said something that, that to me um, seemed very wise. She said, I'm allergic to bears, right? I'm allergic to bears. And after I programmed in Java, I thought that I was allergic to strong static typing. I learned that I was allergic to bad strong static typing. Now, when I look at Haskell's type system, it is absolutely beautiful and um, it has very little ceremony, a whole lot of polymorphism, and really shapes the way that, that you, you think about and reason about your programs. And, um, and it makes the Haskell compiler more than this artificial safety net. It's a real safety net that can, particularly if you're, if you're writing functions um, with, with, um, in very small increments, it can save you a lot of pain. This is just kind of a hint of the flavor of what some of it looks like. So the first line of code, I'm making a, a data element called a suit, and that's, that's um, spades or hearts or diamonds or clubs. And the next data element is a rank, and that's the, the top five, uh, five values for a deck of cards, tens through aces. Um, and then I've got a type of card. This is a type, which, is, um, which has a rank and a suit. And then I have a type deck, which is a list of cards, or type hand, which is also a list of cards, right? So that's the, um, the atomic sense, um, the, the very smallest piece of, of the data system. And then I have a, um, a method, and that has a type definition, and the method defined after that. Well, the type definition says, um, well, the shuffle method, or the shuffle function, um, takes a deck as a parameter and returns a deck. And the interesting thing about Haskell is you don't have functions with more than one parameter, though there's some syntactic sugar to make it look like that. Um, essentially, all the functions take one parameter, 
and you can curry that out um, so that um, so that I might have an API that says, okay, deal me a hand. Well, you have to know the number of hands to deal and the size of the hand. Well, um, so you can imagine building a function that takes hands and size and plugging in only the size. And that's going to leave you a function that still needs the number of hands to deal, right? So that's the idea of currying and partially applied functions. And what Haskell is able to do is say, okay, this type signature for deal is a function that takes an integer. It's going to return a function that takes an integer, and that's going to return a hand. And when you do that, you get an incredibly sophisticated and rich type system that can, that can enable you to solve a whole lot of types of problems polymorphically. And you don't have a lot of type definitions. You have a lot of inference. And so the typing definition doesn't get in your way. OK, that's um, about as much as I'll say about any of the individual languages in terms of code examples. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. Who's this? Yeah, Edward Scissorhands. Um, this is one of my favorite movie characters because he's this, um, this beautiful yet grotesque monster that's, that's the product of bridging two cultures. And if you think about it, that's exactly what's going on with, with the Scala language, right? I would submit that those cuts on his face are not from the scissors. They're really from the blogs from both sides of the object-oriented versus functional debate. <laughs> so these are some of the influences on scholars, some of the things that were going on at the same time. Of course, Haskell, if you ever talk about a functional language that was created after Haskell, it's a big influence. The, the typing models, the lazy processing, um, the way that they handle currying, a lot of things are just beautifully expressed in the Haskell language. What language is this? Java, of course, right? So when, you, when you're basing your model on your, your whole business model, your whole ecosystem on the virtual machine, and you're object-oriented, that is necessarily going to shape the way that your language is built. So we're really uh, merging two worlds, the functional world and the object-oriented world. And um, since Scala is built not only in the, um, the virtual machine, but also in the CLR, you have to consider Java's evil twin. <laughs> What's that? The C sharp, of course, right? I have a demo. OK, cheap shot. <laughs> um, here's another bridge language. This, is, this wasn't really an influence um, on Scala, but I thought it was interesting to include because it's a bridge language between the procedural and the object-oriented worlds. What's this? Anybody guess? Ada. Ada, who said that? That's awesome. Um, so, so really, Ada, um, you know, it's Buzz Lightyear. He thinks he's object oriented. He thinks he can fly. He can't really, um, but get you close enough, right? So, so Ada really had the important idea of the encapsulation of data and behavior. Um, so that was, so this is what Hello World in um, in Scala looks like. And the way that you feel about Scala really depends on your perspective. Now, if you come from where we have come from in this room, a place where we have this beautiful dynamic typing, and we have a lot of flexibility and freedom, and you get plopped down into the, um, the Scala community, well, you're going to feel like, um, like Edward Scissorhands laying on that waterbed with all these, these, um, these sharp scissors, right? Um, it's going to kind of feel like too restrictive, too awkward, and too alien. But if you've come from the Java world and you've been coding that way, and suddenly you're handed things like closures and currying and, and a better concurrency model and ways to actually put the shackles on the language and the languages and the places that it belongs, like around mutable state, you're going to feel really good about the language. And that's kind of the way that the Scala community has, um, has grown up now. OK, I'm going to shift gears. Um, now, we've, we've moved up through 2003, 2004. I'm going to move up to around 2005. Actually, I.O. was created in 2002.
But um, when uh, rails came out and, and uh, 47 signals came out, um, one of, or, I'm sorry, rails came out and um, what was the application they built? 42 things or, does anybody remember? Like 42 things, I think that, that's what it was. Um, one of the, the highest rated things on that site for a long time was learn the IO programming language. And I think that that basically um, started a resurgence and, and well, kind of, kind of started, the, started the snowball rolling for IO and it's really since petered out, but I think that this is a, a small, beautiful language that has a lot to offer. It's really a prototype language that, um, that is very much a messaging language. So you have like a, an object, which is a prototype. It's not based on another class. It's based on cloning another instance. And you call messages on that. And that's essentially what the syntax in I.O. looks like. It's, um, it's message, or, or it's, it's, it's object, and a message with its arguments, and that's going to return an object, and you basically chain those together, and that's it. You also have another form, which is a, a message, or, or an object, operator, object, um, and that's translated to this, um, and, and that's, that's basically it. But since it's a prototype language, and since Steve DeCorte, the um, designer, put no restrictions on, um, on how you could override, which is something called a slot, which is either data or behavior in a prototype language, um, it's, it's really a tremendously flexible language. So you can actually go as far as doing something like this. This little innocuous piece of code does something like this. So if, if the string is nil, I want you to take the, the, um, the call sender, which is whoever invoked this method, whoever called this message, right? So now we're whoever called us. You take one of those slots. It was nil. It's not supposed to be nil. I'm going to retroactively set that value to an empty string. <laughs> That is like so right and so wrong, I can't begin to describe it, right? So wait a minute, I'm taking the person that called me, the object that called me, um, I'm getting a null value, I'm not supposed to have a null value, so I just kind of reach behind myself and fix it for you. <laughs> I'm gonna fix it for you. That's, this, is, this says everything about IO, right? And that's, that's kind of why I picked Ferris Bueller for this, um, you know, for this application. But some of the other things that it got right the concurrency and the performance of this thing should really be kind of slow and awkward because it really is based on a pretty limited object-oriented model. But he got the concurrency libraries right. So you're doing things like messaging, which, which restricts the way that you, can, um, which, that you can go from object to object. It's got an actor model, which builds like a queue for concurrent ac um, access between the, um, the models. Um, it has something called coroutines um, that, that will allow, um, you know, we do mostly preemptive pro uh, multi-processing. Um, this allows um, cooperative multi-processing. And, um, and immutability is built into the model, much like it is in Scala. It's also got this very simple syntax to the point that I think that a pretty good analogy is the Lisp language, where it, since everything is in the same format in Lisp, you don't spend a lot of time learning the syntax. You do spend a lot of time learning the power behind the syntax, but there's also this idea that data is code, and since I am manipulating messages um, in this very simple syntax, it's very easy to do metaprogramming types of things. And since the syntax is small, since the libraries are relatively new and small, the footprint is absolutely tiny. So when, when um, Steve asked, um, when I asked Steve, where have you found IO? He said, well, it's not in production in too many places. But then he said, well, then the places that it was in production were kind of mind blowing, like satellites and you know, Pixar Studios, some of their graphics processors, and you know, it, it, one of the big um, automotive manufacturers, places where they really had to have a small footprint, excellent, um, concurrent performance and, um, and embeddability and um, metaprogramming. So I really liked my time with I.O.
OK. So the last language that we'll talk to you before we kind of wrap up with Ruby is closure. You'll get this a little more in a second. Um, uh, some of you already do. Um, and closure, I think, is, is really, it's, it's Lisp on the JVM, but it's actually a little bit less than that and a little bit more than that. I say it's a little bit less than that because there's some limitations in this Lisp that the, um, the scheme folks are really kind of railing about. Things like the lack of, um, you know, we, we have iteration, what do you have in functional programming? Recursion. And what's the big optimization? Tail call, tail, tail call recursion, right? So um, in, in, in Clojure, they solved this problem by making tail recursion optimization very explicit and very wordy, right? But it, it adds some things that are incredibly powerful um, that, that the original Lisp dialects don't have. First, there are a couple of syntactic tweaks so that I put brackets in some places and I put braces in some places so you don't have this endless chain of parents and, and it's a little bit easier to read. Um, second, I put some restrictions on when I can use um, macros and reader macros so that you don't have this prolif proliferation of dialects. Third, there are some excellent concurrency controls that have been um, invented in the last, uh, especially in the last 10 years, like software and transactional memory. And these ideas are built in, into the Clojure library very artfully and tastefully. So it's, it's a powerful Lisp dialect on probably the, the most important deployment platform of our time. So the big influences are, of course, Java and Lisp. But you can't talk about just Lisp. You have to talk about you know, the dialects of Lisp, right? There's common Lisp and Scheme and, well, maybe there's more than a couple. Maybe there's more than a couple. That one's Microsoft, right? L-sharp. <laughs> and the Hello World looks exactly like you would expect. And I don't want to kind of, I don't really want to break down closure by syntax. I really want to talk about this marriage between um, the JVM and the beautiful language. You know, the JVM, or the whole Java community, is in, it, it really needs a drink, right? It needs this, it needs an injection of fun, it needs an injection of intelligence in, in, in the language. I mean, they're still talking about how great closures are, right? You know, welcome to like, what, five or ten years ago. Um, but still, it's the best deployment environment in the world. The, the JVM is, is um, solid and it's robust. It has some limitations now, like, like um, you know, the inability to do tail call um, recursion optimization. But it's still, um, it's out there. It, politically, it's, it's the, the, best, um, the best deployment option in the world. And you know, until the very last part of the last Star Wars episode, Yoda was in exile, right? That's like the Lisp language. It's been in exile for years. And, and as soon as it starts to get a little, bit of, um, a little bit of momentum, then we just see another splinter faction kind of splinter off and, and break that momentum down in, into like different dialects. But still, the ideas behind Lisp are powerful and compelling. Um, and... I think that given this marriage, this really has a chance to work. And this has, um, you know, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if I like the idea of, of everybody coding Lisp or not, but I think that we, have, we stand a pretty good chance of seeing um, a, a successful marriage here. And that's all I have to say about Lisp for a little bit. So which brings us to Ruby. Um, yeah, this is Mary Poppins, and, and everybody gets it, right? Um, Ruby is about like the, the love and the passion. Um, like like Mary, Mary Poppins was about the magic and the love and the passion. Um, Hello world and Ruby. <laughs> that says it all, doesn't it? I mean, who would do that? Who would do that? We would do that. We would totally do that. Um, but when all is said and done, I just wrote a book called Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. And, um, and you know, 
you can't help but kind of question what you're doing, right? You see all these cool things and all these cool languages. And, and at, at the end of the day, I thought Ruby is still where I need to be. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, first, from the perspective of the things that I really like about the language. Um, so I remember when there, there was like this big community that was dealing with, with the Ruby community. And you know the one I mean. What's that? What language is that? Python, right, right, right. So, you know, there's one way to do everything. There's the right way, right? And, um, and Ruby kind of broke that down. Ruby kind of injected the, the, the Mary Poppins, right? The, the magic and, and, and the fun back into the programming community. And it was done with, with a little bit more venom that, than, than I would prefer, like when the rail stuff started out and, you know, the idea was to, to poke a finger in the eye of the, of the Java establishment. But I still, I really appreciate the way that Ruby brought the passion back to programming. Um, can I hear a hand about that? Yeah. It was very good for my career. I was, I'll, I'll probably would have moved on to a second career if, if I hadn't found Ruby. But still, there are some things that I saw in the other languages that I would like to have in, in Ruby. I'm starting to understand <coughs> that there's a little bit too much of this language in, in Ruby. What's that? Perl, right. So there's, there's still um, not... Sometimes there's not enough discipline, and, and um, it shows up in places that, um, that you know, can, can cost me a good amount of time. And I think that there are some fundamental problems with the way that we code object-oriented applications. I'm almost ready to say that the object-oriented programming paradigm was a mistake. Not quite, but, but I'm almost ready to say that. I think that... Um, as the multi-core systems become more prolific, we will suffer. And we'll suffer because we're programming in a paradigm that doesn't um, handle concurrency very well. And, um, and so in Ruby, we have to be pretty careful about that. So there are some limitations. There are some things that I'd like to see added to Ruby, like um, better guards for mutable state ways to turn to, to lock down classes so you can't so after a certain point after the environment's um, ramped up um, I can I can lock things down and say okay um, no more touching these classes we're you know we're, we're immutable from this point but um, I guess at the end of the day something keeps me coming back to Ruby and if we're able to do more and more in a scripting way, and we're able to tie into these key value databases that are written in languages like Erlang, maybe that's enough. Because after all, a spoonful of sugar does help the medicine go down, right? It's, it's, um, it's the expressiveness and the power of the language that lets us turn that program into our design document. And that's kind of the holy grail um, for software design. That's about all I have to say. I'm only two minutes over. I guess I have a few minutes for questions. Yeah? Did you, uh, did you learn any of these languages explicitly for writing the book, or were you, they all already in the background? <laughs> How long of an effort was it to back end the book? So writing the book took me um, not quite a year and a half, but, um, but kind of closing in on that. And, and yeah, I had to learn a lot of languages for the book. Um, so I knew two of the languages pretty well. Um, and uh, so I knew Erlang pretty well, and I knew um, Ruby pretty well. Um, IO was pretty easy to pick up because it was a prototyping language. Um, everything else was, was really a struggle. The hardest one to learn was Haskell. And, and in fact, I, I put that one off for um, nearly a month. I didn't even start it because I was afraid of it. And um, in the monads especially, it's, it, so so. In Haskell and in a lot of functional languages, the um, easy things are hard and the hard things are really easy. So you spend a lot of time writing and teaching about things that, um, that object-oriented programmers don't think they have to care about, right? Like how to, how to store something in a hash table. Well, wait a minute, that's, that's, a, 
that's a side effect and, and that's mutable state and that kind of blows up everything that you're doing, right? So you, you wind up writing a lot of things about, um, about like the software transactional memory and the different ways to handle that in, in all the different languages. And um, so that was demanding. So it was a hard book, but the funnest book I've ever had to write. Uh, we did a poll of, of the readers at, at the Pragmatic Press, and, um, and all of these languages um, made like the top, the top 15. Um, I really took the top nine, and I cut Python because I, didn't, I only wanted one object-oriented language, and I didn't want to spend my time like learning another object-oriented language well. Um, I cut JavaScript because it, it's really um, too many different programming models at once. And I thought that I had to add back a, a programming language. Um, and so it was between Lua and I.O. And, and I picked I.O. And I, I'm kind of glad I did. Um, if, I, if I do another book, you know, Lua will probably be in there. Python will probably be in there, too. But everything else was basically, you know, write down the list of the languages that um, the, Prags, uh, the Prag readers liked. Thank you.